Well, good evening, everybody. What a joy to welcome you here. I've got the heat set on about 82, so if it, if it starts getting too warm in here, let me know and I'll turn it down a little bit. <laughs> I called Sandy James this afternoon on a completely unrelated question and, and, and asked her, I said, I called to see if you had a space heater, me and these handy could borrow. So we're about to freeze to death over here. You, you got a space heater I could borrow, and she just got real quiet. She said, oh, you crazy preacher. She said, you crazy. I had her going just for a second. But it is a joy to... Have a place where it's cool, amen. I tell you what, I, 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 I just, I know it will go against all of my theology, but if I had anything to say about it, the dude that invented air conditioning in order to have his, have, it, a it, have a special place in heaven, I guarantee you that. But uh, in fact, somebody, somebody must have heard me say that one time because they, somebody shared a meme with me on Facebook one time and had that dude's face. Hey, Pastor Craig, here's a guy that invented air conditioning, so you got him to find or something. It's crazy. <laughs> crazy, crazy people have crazy friends. I guess, it, I guess they just sort of find me out. But anyway, what a joy to be able to be in a place where it is cool and comfortable and thankful that we've got um, families that I know of and that are, that are, during these times, you worry about folks that are homeless. And I was telling Ronnie, folks are out working in it and having to be out and about. So uh, we're much in prayer for those that are struggling with this heat, those that um, don't have a choice but have to be out in it. But we don't we want to go to the Lord in prayer, uh, remembering several needs tonight. Uh, I had to... Uh, Talk to Brother David this afternoon. Miss Judy is, is is trending in the right direction, so she's feeling real good for all intents and purposes. But today was was feeling pretty nauseous today. They can't exactly put their finger on exactly why, but she just feels kind of lousy today. But but overall, getting better. Said the wounds are healing, and uh, she she's doing well as far as all of that goes. But uh, still in the hospital, and uh, Lord willing, I get to see her tomorrow if, if we can pull that all together. Um, Miss Paula still has hopes to come home, if not this week, maybe the first of next week. Uh, so we much in prayer for that that adjustment because if you if you've been to Mike and Paula's house, you know that you can't get into their house without going up six or eight steps every direction. So uh, he he told me that he might have to have a little bit of uh, physical help to get her in the house. So if that comes together, we may have to call on a few of you. We'll see how that goes, but we may be able to, to handle that ourselves. But uh, keep him in prayer. He's so anxious to get her home as any as anybody can imagine. He, he can't wait to get her home where she belongs, and nobody wants to be there more than Miss Paula wants to be there. But um, I guess those are the two that are pressing on my mind, I guess, the most, just because they are battling sicknesses. We're awful glad that, uh, that Miss Nikki's feeling better. She had a rough week of 10 days there for a while. I'm glad to have her with us tonight. We've not had an update on Martina in a while. All things are kind of steady with her. Back to work. Back to work. Oh, praise God. God just goes around and said, watch this. Watch this right here. Watch, watch what I'm going to do right here. I hadn't heard that latest update. I thought it was still kind of in the, in the horizon somewhere. So don't even, hallelujah, hallelujah. Amen. Be much in prayer for the service on Sunday. Let me mention this again. For those especially watching at home, uh, Phillips and Banks will be here in concert at both 9 o'clock and the 11 o'clock service. Uh, so I'm always looking forward to having them young in the house with us. So you come out and, and uh, smile at them. They'll, they'll sing better for you if you smile at them. So you come out Sunday morning, we'll have a great time. Sunday school in between, uh, regular hour of Sunday school, but two, two concerts Sunday morning at 9 and 11. Phillips and Banks right here with us. Hope that you'll make plans to, to come be with us, especially if you're watching from home and you don't normally come to New Salem. Hope and pray that you might be with us for Sunday. And you don't have to look at this. You can hear some good singing. Amen. Would there be others tonight? Any, any spoken needs or prayer requests or concerns? We need to be aware of. I know Sandy Casmer has been a little under the weather this week, so I don't know if she's feeling better. I talked to her yesterday and uh, said some kind of a viral something just has to kind of run its course. And that's all. That's all the info she gave me. Uh, but uh, pray for Miss Sandy. Uh, anyone else tonight with a need or a prayer request? Anyone? All right. Keep those unspoken needs, and worries, and cares of life. There, all of us have probably got those, if you'll be honest. Amen. Amen. Well, let's go to the Lord in prayer and get right into our study tonight. Heavenly Father, I'm so thankful, truly overwhelmed by your goodness that you poured into my life. Lord, I thank you for providing uh, the way you do. I thank you for healing. I thank you, Lord, for protection. I thank you, Lord, for a couple days away with, uh, with Tammy's mom and uh, watching over us while we were gone. And, and I just thank you, Father, for a good time and, and uh, good fellowship. I thank you for the privilege to come back tonight, Lord, and open up your word and, and, uh, and uh, with, with your help, 
your blessing and with your anointing share uh, what it is I've learned uh, in my preparation, Lord, and I pray a blessing on this study tonight. I, I pray as I always do, Lord, before I ever touch your word, Lord, you'll cleanse my heart, that you'll cleanse my mind, Lord, that I would be a vessel uh, suitable for your purposes, that you can use for your glory tonight in this lesson, this teaching will be will be an encouragement and a challenge, Lord, as we as we remember um, what all Paul went through so that we can 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 uh, live today as Christian Americans. Many much of that can go back back directly Lord, to what Paul accomplished, Lord, during those early, early days of the church. I thank you, Lord, for this church. I thank you, Lord, for the place it's held in this community for all these many years. And as we uh, begin to think about homecoming coming up next month and uh, celebrating our 20 years as pastor of this church, Lord, next month, it just truly overwhelms me to think, Lord, of what a blessing it is in my life to be able to be a part of the, of the of this chapter, Lord, and, and the very beautiful and uh, just just history of this of this great church not to ask you blessing on our church I thought as we begin thinking about the new year and and new ministry opportunities lord and and, and we thank you for your provision financially lord and for the new faces that we're seeing on a regular basis and i just ask you to continue to guide us go before us as we've said so often lord we don't want to miss your schedule we don't want to miss your perfect timing lord your your plan your your uh, direction I said before, Lord, I don't want to run ahead of your perfect timing, but I don't want to lag behind. So I pray, God, for new opportunities, Lord, of ministry this new year, and you'll guide us, Lord, in those endeavors. Father, there's a lot tonight, Lord, that are standing in need of prayer. Many that are sick in body, God, I pray a continued blessing, Lord, on Miss Paula Waterhouse. We give you all glory for the progress that she's made, and, uh, and the therapy has continued to work. She's getting stronger every day, and for that we thank you. And we pray, God, you'll get her home. Uh, sooner than later, of course, she's so desperate, desperate to be. And God, I do ask a blessing on Miss Judy tonight. Thank you, Lord, for successful surgery and the recovery that, she, that she's already made. And I pray, oh God, that you'll continue to bless her and as well, God, get her up and home, Father, where, where David needs her to be and where she wants to be. And Father, you know all the other worries, the unspoken needs. Miss Rena's was a reminder that all of us have got those. Lord, we've got our children that we worry about and our grandkids that we're worried about. And, Lord, the, the, the challenges of, of life, Lord, I think of those families, Lord, that are trying to, to raise youngins, Lord, in this day and time, Lord, when, 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 when everything around us is turned topsy-turvy, Lord, as you said what happened in your word, where right is now be wrong and wrong is, is right, God. But again, fulfillment of prophecy, but it's still challenging, God, to try to raise a family, Lord, with godly principles. I pray, Lord, for those parents, Lord, those grandparents that are involved in raising raising up this next generation. I pray for the ministries of our church as we strive to, to minister to those kids, God. I pray for Tim and his true his crew over at the spot tonight, Lord, and what Miss Tammy wants you doing with the kids in action. I pray, God, your blessing on the ministries of our church. Lord, you know every need before us, whether it's written down or if it's never even been spoken out loud, Lord, you know exactly the things that worry us. And I pray, oh God, that you'll just come alongside each of those worries and burdens, bear those burdens, provide that need, and do what only you're able to do. And we pray that you'll do it in, in, in a God-sized fashion and help us as your people to be on the lookout. And be ever mindful and be quick to give you praise and glory for it all. I love you and I thank you for the privilege to teach. Bless this time in your word. It is my prayer in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. amen. And amen. Amen. We are going to continue this walk through the book of Acts until the Lord tells me not to. Uh, you know me well enough that that's my, that's my, uh, the way I operate. As long as he tells me it's okay, I'll camp right out here and tell you all these stories from the book of Acts until he directs me otherwise. With all that being said, we're in chapter 17 tonight. Acts chapter number 17, uh, we'll begin about verse number 15, I guess, 15 or 16, right in that area. Let me, let me open with a, with a Charles Schultz illustration. I think it's very timely. Um, Charles Schultz, of course, the Peanuts comic strip author and, and, and artist. I remember one one time it said, it, it had Linus and Charlie Brown in, engaged in this, this real serious conversation. And Linus asks Charlie Brown, he said, I've got a theological question. And he says, okay. He says, when, when you die and go to heaven, are you graded on a percentage or on a curve? Well, Charlie Brown says, kind of flatly, says, on a curve, naturally. 
And Linus asked him, next, Why, how can you be so sure? And Charlie Brown's response was a very deep word from Charles Schultz, I think. But Charlie Brown, he kind of answered, he says, I'm always sure about things that are a matter of opinion. Let that sink in. I'm always sure about things that are a matter of opinion. And I, and I, and I thought that, that, that kind of fits where we find Paul here in Acts chapter 17. Um, I, I, think, I think perhaps one of the most prominent theological matters of opinion in America today and it may not be worded just like this, but the premise is very, very widespread. Does it really matter what I believe? Because don't all roads lead to heaven? And there's a whole lot of folks uh, carrying that kind of thinking through life because they're hearing that a lot in a lot of our mainstream media. Now, if, if, if you were to say that there is a real spiritual side to America today, um, You've, you've said the truth, but you've really not said anything at all because that should not be viewed as a compliment. Just to say that America is a very spiritual country because there's a whole lot of spiritual stuff going on out there. There's, a whole, there's all sorts of spiritualities, I guess you might say. As I mentioned Sunday, uh, I... I Google has, has become kind of one of my study guides when I'm, when I'm putting teachings and, and lessons there. It used to be the dictionary, it used to be the encyclopedias, now it's Google. Um, so I did it again. Just on a lark, I, I typed the word spirituality into the Google search bar. Page after page after page after page of stuff began to scroll in front of me. From everything that Native American Indians believed, all the Far East things and mysticism and crystals and um, the Royal College of Psychiatry defined it this way. Spirituality involves the recognition of a feeling or a sense of belief that there is something greater than myself, something more to being human than sensory experience, and that the greater whole of which we are a part of is cosmic or divine in nature. Okay. The Canadian Virtual Hospice page says that every person has spirituality. Whatever moves or expresses your spirit, I can't even say that in, in real, in, with a straight face. Whatever moves or expresses your spirit or inner energy is part of your spirituality. In some senses, your spirituality is expressed in every aspect of personal and public life. It's just who you are, woven into expressed through every thought, feeling, and action. The deeper I read, the more deeper it got. The University of Montana of the Twin Cities psychological psychology department has a has an article there that says what is spirituality taking charge of your health and well-being spirituality.com is the website of, of the christian science monitor which is a you might have heard of them spirituality and practice.com spirituality for today and all of that's just on the first page right? i said i'm not tired of writing so i stopped right about there so you can see that just the, just the word rarely has anything to do with what we know to be about the Spirit of God and what we know to be spiritual living. In this text, beginning in chapter 17 and verse number 15, Paul conducts his own version, Ken, I guess you could say, of a search of spirituality in the city of Athens. And suffice to say that he is shocked by what he finds. Start with me in Acts chapter 17. I'll be reading from verse 15. Acts 17, verse 15, says this. Now those who escorted Paul brought him as far as Athens. And receiving a command for Silas and Timothy to come to him as soon as possible, they left. Keep that in mind. That's a key uh, part of this narrative. Silas and Timothy goes a different direction. Verse 16, now while Paul was waiting for them at Athens, his spirit was being provoked within him as he was observing the city full of idols. So he was reasoning in the synagogue with the Jews and the God-fearing Gentiles and in the marketplace every day with those who happened to be present. And also some of the Epicurean and Stoic philosophers were conversing with them. Some were saying, what would this idol babbler wish to say? Others, he seems to be a proclaimer of strange deities because he was preaching Jesus and the resurrection. And they took him 
and brought him to the Areopagus, saying, May we know what this new teaching is which you are proclaiming. For you are bringing some strange things to our ears, so we want to know what these things mean. Now, verse 21, Now all of the Athenians and the strangers visiting there used to spend their time in nothing other than telling or hearing something new. Now keep in mind, Luke is writing this book. He's, he's tagged along now with Paul on this missionary journey. Some have suspected and proposed that maybe as his personal assistant or, or his medical personal physician, but he's writing this firsthand uh, account. And of all the people that they meet, for whatever reason, two groups stand out to Luke. And he specifies them. He talks about the Epicureans and the Stoics. Now, we may not call them that today, but the, the idea of this two group of, of, of philosophers is not that foreign to what you see going on around you today. The Epicureans believed that, that everything happens by way of chance. If God, if the gods, maybe that's a better way to say it, if the gods, little g, if the, if the gods existed at all, then they're truly uncaring about man's situation. Death is the end of all life. They didn't believe in heaven. They didn't believe in hell. And the chief aim of life is to get all the pleasure you can out of life while you're still on this side of the grave. Sounds not so far-fetched from where we are today in a lot of people's minds. The Stoics, on the other hand, they were very moral people. The Stoics believed that everything, everything living, everything not living, everything had the spirit of God within them. Uh, you could pair, compare that very easily to, to the New Age movement. Everything that happens has got all about it. They, they would, they'd be the tree-hugging environmentalists of their day, social reformers and, and activists of their day. You, and we can, we can identify them in our, in our world today. Both groups had this in common. They, they failed to recognize that God is outside of his creation. They, they had not grabbed on the idea yet that God knows us by name. They had not grabbed the idea yet that God desires a personal relationship with us as his creation. They failed to see that God will one day hold us to account to himself. There, there, there are still countless people from countless religions claiming that they have touched God in one sense or another through all of their chants and incantations and rituals and, and all the things that they do and bringing us to the place in our world today, the very common idea that everybody's right up to a point. And since everybody is right, then all the different faiths have to be leading us to the same direction. Along the line, somebody developed the phrase that all roads lead to heaven. That's not original thinking to us. Centuries ago, in a city called Athens, that was the predominant belief held by a whole lot of folks. A little bit of history thrown in here just to keep bringing this thing alive for you. Athens was a very, 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 very religious city. History says that it was home to, at one time, as many as 30 thousand idols. One scholar noted that it was easier to find an idol in Athens than to find a man sometimes. And as, as highly religious as they were, Athenians were, were still confused about which God to worship. So just to cover all their bases, they worshiped them all. In fact, jump down to verse 21. Paul says, that in case they missed one, they had even erected an altar to an unknown God. So just to make sure we've got all of our T's crossed and our I's dotted, we'll build one more idol, and we'll just we'll let him be, that'll be the altar to, to the unknown God. Now it'd be easy for me to sit up here and, and kind of just, you know, foo-foo and laugh and, and, and say, boy, those Athenians, boy, they were a bunch of clueless, hayseed, uneducated rednecks. But before you dismiss those, you've got to remember a thing or two. You've got to remember that Athens was the center of learning in its day. You may not know this, but the very idea of democracy that we put much, so much stock in finds its root in Athens, Greece. It was a center of, a center of philosophy, 
of literature, of science and art. Many of the, of the world's early, early great philosophers and thinkers lived in Athens. I'm talking about Plato and Socrates and Euripides and Sophocles. These guys, this is where they called home. Athens had one of the greatest universities of the ancient world. It was a city dedicated to truth and wisdom. But yet in the midst of their search for truth and wisdom, there was rampant confusion. Because when he came to God, capital G, God, they just didn't know what truth to embrace. They believed that all the gods, little g, all the gods were somehow equal, and they just didn't know which god to hang their hat on, so to speak. And, I, and again, I look back at that and read all of those, those, those historical times and read all of the commentaries, and, I, and, and, and it screams 2023 at me. Because, because it seems that all through history, the intellectual types have always been unable and unwilling to discover and embrace the truth about God. They relegate what we, what we know to be true, what we hold our hearts, what we build our lives on, they've relegated that to a matter of personal taste rather than objective reality. You talk to a lot of, of intellectual types and they'll, they'll, they'll classify religion kind of like they, kind of like our taste in clothes or your favorite color of car or your favorite food. There's nothing, there's no right or wrong to it. It's just a matter of your personal bent, your own personal taste. If you like Hinduism as opposed to Buddhism, Good for you. It's no big deal. It's no different than preferring Big Macs to Whoppers. And if there is a God, he'll understand. Because after all, everybody's just trying to reach God in their own special way. We're all just trying to reach God in a different way. It shouldn't make any difference as long as you're what? Sincere. As long as you believe it with everything in you, then that's really all that matters. Let me tell you something. The one thing that has gotten Christianity in trouble down through the years let me rephrase that. One of the things. Sometimes it's just us. Sometimes it's our own personality and our own mouth. But I'm, I'm talking about if we're talking true foundational truths, the one thing that has gotten Christianity in trouble with people down through the ages is that we've always declared it does make a difference what you believe. That's why it makes it uncomfortable to have Christianity in the public square. That's why it makes the people uncomfortable for us to stand up and declare all we know that the Bible declares. Because John 14, 6 says, Jesus himself, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. For us to stand up and believe that and declare that makes us bigoted, makes us closed-minded, makes, uh, makes us push people away. Acts chapter 4, verse number 12, salvation is found in no one else, for there is no other name given under heaven by which men must be saved. So it's no surprise that when we come to Acts chapter 17, we find the Apostle Paul telling the Athenians the exact same thing. Notice what he says in verse 22. So Paul stood in the midst of the Eurotopus. This is, or Mars Hill is translating in King James. And this is what he says, verse 22. Men of Athens, I observe that you are very religious in all aspects. Then he goes on to say, For while I was passing through and examining the objects of your worship, I also found an altar with this inscription to an unknown God. Therefore, what you worship in ignorance, hmm, this I proclaim to you. Men of Athens, he says, what you worship as something unknown, I get to proclaim to you today. So Jesus said it in Luke, or John. Peter says it in Acts chapter 4. And now Paul. All of them declaring that God has no intention of being tolerant anymore. Jump down to verse 30, notice what Paul said. Therefore, having overlooked the times of ignorance, God is now declaring to men that all people everywhere should repent. 
That's huge. Paul is declaring that in the past, God has overlooked such ignorance. He's let people run amok. He's let them run around and worship anything they want to worship, but not anymore. God is calling for repentance, period. He's not calling for open-mindedness. He's not calling for political correctness. The truth is that people are not going to get into heaven by being Hindu. People are not going to get into heaven by being Muslim. People are not going to get into heaven by flashing their Buddhist statue. The crux of Paul's argument is the same as we're preaching today. God's calling us to repentance because a day of judgment is fastly approaching. Again, knowing the audience and the connections we can make, the comparisons we can make to our own society today, Intellectual types are fond of telling people that no one has the right to tell you. No one has the right to tell someone else what they believe is wrong. That's just not nice. Look at verse 31. Because he's fixed a day in which he will judge the world in righteousness, though through a man whom he has appointed, having furnished proof to all men by raising him from the the dead. Paul is in essence telling those folks and telling us that it's not nice not to tell people that they're wrong because judgment's coming. And if people don't recognize that what they believe is wrong, the resulting consequences will be eternal. You know, even smart people ought to realize that you can't be open-minded when it comes to God. Think about this. Think about, think about all the fields of study that, that you may dabble in or you consider yourself an expert in. But you think about this. In just about every serious field of knowledge, open-mindedness is not allowed. Give me an example. There's no room for broad-mindedness in the chemical laboratory. Water will always be composed of two parts hydrogen and one part oxygen. The slightest deviation from that formula is not allowed. There's no room for broad-mindedness when it comes to music. There'll be no conductor that allow his first violin to play even as much as a half a note, half a step off from what's written in the music. There's no wiggle room. There's no wiggle room in a mathematics classroom. Geometry, calculus, trigonometry, none of those allow for variation from exact accuracy, even, even for old time's sake. You're not going to hear anybody say, you know, back when I was a kid, two plus two didn't equal four. It did. It always has. The solution of a problem is either right or wrong. There is no tolerance. There's, there's, no, there's no broad mindedness. There's no open, open mindedness on the athletic field. The game cannot, the game that you're playing has to be played within the rules, and there's no favor shown for charity's sake. Well, we feel sorry for you. Okay, we'll, we'll give you four outs. Y'all get, y'all, you can all bat one more time. We'll, we'll, we'll get, well, go, ahead, go ahead and give it to them. They're pitiful. But we, no. Every serious field of knowledge refuses to allow for tolerance of what's true. And here in Acts chapter 17, Paul preaches that it's the same when it comes to the things of God. So how do we know that what we believe is right? Hmm. I remember as a young man, I don't know how old I was, but I, but I was not old enough to drive or I would have been driving. I remember having a conversation with my dad. I was in the back seat of the car. I don't remember anybody else in the car or not, don't even matter. I was in the back seat, he's driving. I always drove, always on the road right behind him. So I mean, I can I can remember us. I mean, anybody else in the car, it don't really matter. But I was having one of those, I wouldn't call it a crisis of faith kind of moments, but I was in that moment of where I was working through some stuff. And I remember asking Dad, I said, Dad, what if we're wrong? I've heard you preach all of my life and, 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 and when we believe that the Bible is true, but what if we're wrong? 
And Dad told me in so many words, I wouldn't dare begin to quote him directly, but the, but the lesson was very clear to me. Dad told me in, in no uncertain terms that that's where faith comes in. And he began to teach me as a young man the authority of God's word. That the word will stand when nothing else will. I heard one of the preachers said this way one time. He says, if I'm okay and you're okay, then how do you explain the cross? Hmm? In any way that, we've, that we strive as, as pastors and teachers and dads and grandparents, let, let me encourage you by saying that those that might issue some kind of a challenge of our faith, can I remind you that you don't have to defend the Bible or anything in the Bible. There'll be those, maybe not your own family, but those, those naysayers, those that are just trying to, you know, get your dander up. Do you really believe that God created the world in six days? Do you really believe that? Do you really believe that there was a flood that covered the entire earth? Do you really believe that Moses parted the Red Sea and, and, and they crossed across on dry? Do you really believe that Jonah was able to survive for three days in the belly of a great fish? I've, I've, I've fielded all of those questions before. And, it was a, and, it, and it's not been that so long ago that God brought me to this revelation. He, 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 he caught me off by myself one time and told me in no uncertain terms, said, man, you don't have to defend me. You don't have to defend the Bible or anything in it. Oh, yeah, it's important to know the answers to questions like that and other questions, but, but the truth is the Bible doesn't need defending. What we need to be doing is proclaiming the truth of Jesus Christ. That's what Paul meant. Paul would later write in 1 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse number 2. He said, when I first came to you, I resolved to know nothing while I was with you except what? Jesus Christ and him crucified. That, that's all I brought. It's the only thing I had in my sack. It's the only thing I had on my person. Because if the skeptic can get us sidetracked into arguing about all those other discussional topics, then he's dragged us away from the only point that really matters. The only proof that Paul says we need to be concerned with is Jesus. That's what he says right here, verse number 31. He's fixed a day in which he will judge the world in righteousness through a man whom he has appointed, having furnished proof to all men by raising him from the dead. Later on, he writes to the church at first in Corinth, he says, we preach Christ crucified under the Jews a stumbling block, under the Greeks foolishness. But unto them which are called both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. Because the foolishness of God is wiser than men and the weakness of God is stronger than men. I wish I could tell you that this is one of those kind of Pentecost kind of moments. That Paul stands there and preaches his guts out and 5,000 people get saved. But the truth is, Paul doesn't win the debate here. There are no, there is no mad rush of converts rushing to the platform to get saved. In fact, what, read it for yourself. Notice this is verse 32. This is the response. When they heard of the resurrection of the dead, that's the, they, he lost them. He, he lost them at the resurrection of the dead. I'll tell you why in just a minute. When they heard of the resurrection of the dead, verse 32, some began to sneer, but others said, we shall hear you again concerning this. So Paul went out of their midst. The resurrection of Jesus, the very, the very linchpin of the entire gospel message was to the majority of Athenians laughable. Because they were all steeped deeply in the teachings of, of Apollo. Apollo said, once a man dies and the earth drinks up his blood, there is no resurrection. Period. So this was the kind of thinking that they had all heard all of their life. So the talk of a man rising from the grave was difficult to believe. That was just a bridge too far. You know, some were polite about it. and They were polite enough. Last part of verse 32 We'll hear you again concerning this. That's basically them saying, okay, well, that's, we'll talk about that later. Some were just openly hostile. 
sneering at the very idea. There are those that maintain that, that because Paul's preaching was so poorly received at Athens, that it must have seemed like a failure. But Paul had been faithful to his task, faithful to his mission of proclaiming Jesus Christ and him crucified to these people. And notice the victory that he finds in verse 34. Some men joined him and believed, among whom also were Dionysus and the, um, one of those guys. I'm not going to try the Arapa guy, maybe? Yeah. <laughs> and a woman named Damaris and others with them. I read somewhere that, that mankind, mankind is incurably religious. I've heard Dad say before, said, and I remember, I remember the dog he was talking about when he gave, we had a little dog named Chip. He was like a miniature bulldog. I loved that dog. He was about this big, had that bulldog face. And anytime the kitchen door got left open, Chip came running in the house. Knowing full well he wasn't supposed to be in the house. And he'd stay in the house until somebody called him. He'd stay in the kitchen. He'd wander into the living room until somebody called him. But as soon as somebody called his name, he'd turn into a little pug tail and head out the back door. They said, oh, Chip's got a little bit of religion in him. Knowing full well he's not supposed to be doing, and he'll keep doing it until somebody calls him on it. Man is incurably religious. But the truth is, only the Christian faith really works. Only the Christian faith provides hope when we stare into the coffin of our loved one or our best friend. But the even deeper truth before us is truth. The deeper issue is the fact that the Christian faith is grounded in reality and there is nothing more real than the resurrection. It's an event that, that skeptics try to ridicule, but they can't successfully counter it. Mere spirituality that we talked about, that Google search, it might leave us with, with warm, fuzzy feelings but nothing, nothing approaching the, the sure hope that we have because we put our trust in the cross of Calvary and the empty tomb of Christ. Nothing approaches that kind of hope. Nothing we can put our hands to in this world. I, I would go so far as to suggest to you that people are rejecting the gospel not because they think it's false, but because we've allowed it to become viewed by so many people as, as trivial and intolerable. They write us off because to them it seems as if we're, we're bigots and, and we're closed-minded to every other people of all other faiths. But it's not that at all. When understood in its context, the gospel message is the good news about heaven, the good news about eternity, but it must not become this isolated thing in just one little corner of our lives that we break out on Sundays or Wednesdays or, or, or at funerals. It's got to define who we are. It must continually be a connection of this life to the next life and would tell people what Paul was preaching to the folks in Athens, that there is a judgment day coming, that we're all going to stand before God the Creator one of these days, that every knee will bow and every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is exactly who he said he is. And we'll either make that profession on this side of the grave or we'll make it at the foot of the throne of God. Let me push a little bit further on to verse 8 in chapter 18. We've got a few minutes left. Let's, let, let, me, let me, chapter 18 is going to be a news flash to some of you. Chapter 18 is going to help you because it's helped me. It's almost like you can hear the old fast did, 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 you know, this just in from the main office in Lincoln, Nebraska. The great apostle Paul was human just like the rest of us. Bum, bum, bum. Something interesting happens in chapter 18. Is at this point in, in this walk through the book of Acts, We've, we're going to entertain the very likely possibility that the Apostle Paul, for all of his boldness and all of his hard-charging preaching the power of the gospel, he started to waver just a bit. 
he, he's heading to Corinth, chapter 18. is his ministry in the city of Corinth. And later, he would write a letter to the Corinth church. We know that it's First and Second Corinthians. And he, he, he later writes to the church that he had come there in weakness and fear and with much trembling. He openly confessed it. He, he don't mind them knowing that little side of himself. God help us all not be so full of ourselves that we can't admit from time to time that we've had weakness and fear and much trembling. Because think about this. Even, even when he responded to that Macedonian call, come over and help us. And when he first went over into Greece, he, he had that vision from God and the man says, come over into Macedonia and help us. He stepped into that in faith believing that's what God was directing and calling him to do. But he had been driven out of the first three cities he had visited. This is laying in his mind. He, he, he thought he's obedient. He follows in faith believing, following what he thought to be the plan of God. But the first, first three cities, boom, 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 no, thank you, away with you kind of thing. He had, he had just been dismissed from Athens. We saw that in chapter 17 with, with, with quiet contempt. Thankfully, this time he wasn't violently driven out like he was numerous other times. He was just said, okay, we'll talk about this another time. You know, head on down the road. And he would later write, again, about this, his, this experience in Corinth. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 58 he writes, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. It's an interesting choose of phraseology there. It's an interesting uh, word that he puts together there, knowing that your labor is not in vain. But the reason I say it's interesting to me is because Paul does not feel that way when he first comes to Corinth. I'm going to show you what happens while he was there. It gets him to the place later where he can write those words of encouragement to these same people in this city of Corinth. Let me make a quick comparison. If, if Athens is, is the intellectual center of the ancient world that we just read about in chapter 17, Corinth is, is the commercial trade center of the ancient world. It was a seaport junction, sea routes both east and west, and it was also a junction of land routes north and south. Corinth was located in the most prime spot for commercial trade because there, there was a narrow land bridge. If you go back, don't look at it right now, go back and look at some of the maps in the back of your book, back of your Bible there, and find the, 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 the Paul's journeys. And if you look at Corinth, Corinth sits on a little narrow land bridge. It's only about four, maybe seven miles wide, and it connects the northern part of Greece with the southern part of Greece. So that means that all the commercial traffic land traffic between northern Greece and southern Greece had to go through Corinth. And it also had a seaport on the eastern and the western side of that land bridge. And they say that smaller boats would be dragged across this peninsula of land, again only four, maybe seven miles. So it was easier to drag it across this little land bridge than to sail all the way down because it was so treacherous. The, the, the winds and the seas to, to sail around the southern part of Greece was so treacherous, it was easier just to put it on rollers and drag it across the land. And Corinth was right in the middle of that. North and south traffic, east and west traffic. Boom, there sent Corinth. One of the distinguishing features of the city of Corinth was the, was the temple of Aphrodite. You may not know Aphrodite, but you, but you may know the name Venus. Venus, if you will. Please sing, you know that song. That's all I'm talking about. Venus was, was the goddess of love, Aphrodite in the Greek language. And the temple of Aphrodite was located on this hill, this massive hill overlooking the city of Corinth. And the way that you worship the goddess of love, as the name might imply, is you make your way down to the temple and you have sexual relations with one of the thousand temple prostitutes that would come into town every evening to ply their trade. So immorality in Corinth was so well known that to, to accuse someone of acting like a Corinthian was an insult. And, and it was actually a charge, you, you was accusing someone of sexual immorality. There, there was no city in the ancient Roman Empire more corrupt than Corinth. And it, it appears that when Paul first landed there, he was both depressed and discouraged. He, he's confronted with the depravity of the city to the point that it almost overwhelmed him. 
the challenge in front of him was overwhelming. Every depraved thing that the imagination of man could come up with, Paul saw it going on in Corinth. One writer I read after suggested that that, that Romans chapter 1, verse 26 and 28, through 28, if you want to write down and go read it sometime, some have said that that was probably inspired by what he witnessed in Rome or, or in Corinth. For he writes, For this cause God gave them up to vile affections, for even the women did change the natural use in that which is against nature. Remember that passage? And likewise also the men leaving the natural use of the women burned in their lust towards one another, men with men working which is seemly, which is unseemly, receiving themselves that uh, recompense of the error, that, that even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a reprobate mind. You, you probably remember that. That's the past I'm talking about. And some have suggested that Paul was writing that because of the mess that he saw going on in Corinth. But see, not only, not only was Paul seen overwhelmed by the immorality of Corinth, he also finds himself very much alone. Remember I told you back in chapter 17 and verse number 15 that Silas and Timothy had gone a different direction? So he shows up here by himself. Paul faces the challenge of presenting the gospel to an entire city of a population well north of 250,000 people by himself. Plus, to make matters worse, he also has to face the sobering truth that he has no means of support on which to live. So he's by himself in a strange city without a job and knowing why it was that he's there is to preach the gospel. So we begin to see how easy it would become, it would, it, would, it would be for him to become overwhelmed by this. But God is already on the move. God has already got a place in mind, got a, got a work in mind for him. Not long after arriving in Corinth, Paul makes lifetime friends we don't know it from, from Acts chapter 18, but we know it from later writings. He makes lifetime friends with a couple that happen to be in the same line of work as Paul. Paul practiced the trade of tent making from time to time in order to pay the bills, in order to, to be able to travel and to evangelize. In fact, I, I've, I've heard it stated that in, in some missionary circles, that when, when we talk about missionaries that support themselves on the field by working in the local economy, sometimes that's referred to as tent making, going back to this very idea. But I'm talking about Priscilla and Aquila. Again, it's, this, is, this is brand new words, brand new names here in Acts chapter 18. It says that in chapter 1, it says, After these things he left Athens and went to Corinth, and he found a Jew named Aquila, a native of Pontus, having recently come from Italy with his wife Priscilla, because Claudius had commanded all the Jews to leave Rome, he came to them, and because he was of the same trade, he stayed with them, and they were working, for by trade they were tent makers. It's not hard to figure this out. Strange town. After he's found out where the synagogue was, and after he's found out where the jail was, maybe he's thinking, I'm going to have to find somebody to pay the bills. I, I think it's a very easy stretch. I think he's going to find the tent makers. Maybe there was a, a, a corner, you know, where they made, you know, their part of town where tents were all made. See, I'm, I'll go find me a part-time job. I've got that skill set. I think it's a very easy to figure out how he met Priscilla and Aquila. Uh, he, Luke tells us enough about the story that they had, uh, they had become believers, I believe, prior to coming to Corinth. Uh, they would prove to be invaluable uh, as leaders of this Corinthian church. They had been driven out of Rome by, by the Emperor Claudius, as a lot of uh, other non-citizen Jews had done, and they, they had landed here in Corinth. Well, verse 4 says that Paul uh, reasoned in the synagogue every Sabbath and persuaded both Jews and Greeks. I think there's an interesting little hidden jewel right there that almost makes it sound like, because he, he's working full-time as a tent maker, he has to limit his ministry to what he can do on the Sabbath. He's not a full-time missionary. He's only, he's only able to do that on the Sabbath. And in addition to the friendship that Paul strikes up with Aquila and Priscilla, finally, uh, Silas and Timothy, they arrive from Macedonia. Verse 5, they came down from Macedonia, Paul and Sil Silas and Timothy. And in verse 5 says they began devoting, Paul begins devoting himself completely to the word, solemnly testifying to the Jews that Jesus was the Christ. There's a couple other places 
Thessalonians, I believe it's where it's written, that they brought good news of the steadfast faith of the Thessalonians, and they also brought money. They also brought a, uh, some money supplied by the church at Philippi. I think that's the Thessalonians where it's found. But anyway, that, that financial gift that Paul, that Silas and Timothy brings allows Paul to give up his tent making and to go to testify that Jesus is the Christ on a more full-time basis. And that's when the opposition begins to arise. Paul, Paul, Paul had been around the block enough times that he's noticed a pattern. I walk in this new town, I'll start preaching. And you mark my words. They'll stir up the people against me I'll be dragged into court, and after that, I'll be beaten and probably thrown into jail. Happened enough time. Just it's, it's routine now for him. Guess what? In Acts chapter 18, that's exactly what the people try to do. But Paul had a lot of good reasons to be discouraged. And chances are, if you was to look at your own life, you'll find in, in, in your life that you found times where it was easy to be discouraged. But just when Paul was the most discouraged, God intervened in several ways to help him. Let me quickly summarize what I've already told you about this story. First of all, God sent people to help him. He put him in, he put him in touch with Aquila and Priscilla, and then Silas and Timothy shows up. God surrounded Paul with a strong force of faithful people. When Paul later writes to the to the church in Rome and talks about Aquila and Priscilla, he calls them fellow workers in Christ and that they had risked their lives for him. These two close friends proved to be a great source of strength. Plus, Silas and Timothy comes back. So the Lord seldom solves the problem of discouragement in our lives without using people. More times than not, if you used to testify, in those times that you were feeling discouraged and down and out, somebody came by your way. God brought somebody your way and gave you a word of encouragement or a little present or a text or a phone call, proving the simple truth that we're loved by him through them. God used them to show the love that he has for us. He can help us in those times of, the, of the discouragement. Number two, God encouraged him by blessing his work with success. Notice verse 6. When they resisted and blasphemed, he shook out his garments and said to them, your blood be on your own heads. I'm clean. From now on, I'll go to the Gentiles. And he left there and went to the house of a man named Titius Justus, a worshiper of God, whose house was next to the synagogue. Crispus, the leader of the synagogue, believed in the Lord with all his household. And many of the Corinthians, when they heard were, being, were believing and being baptized. He may have had a, just very little success in Athens, and the success in Corinth might have been slow in coming, but now God begins to give him fruit for his labor. It was a record day when Crispus, the ruler of the synagogue, came to faith in Christ. That's huge, y'all. The word of God was taking effect in Corinth. People were beginning to place their faith in the risen Christ. So God put people in his path. God began to encourage him by seeing the greatest success and blessing the work of his hands. But thirdly, I believe the Lord knew where Paul's heart was, how discouraged the man of God was starting to feel. So God comes directly to him and speaks words of encouragement. You don't find red letter text too often in this part of the book of Acts. But you find it right here in verse 9. And the Lord said to Paul in the night by a vision, don't be afraid any longer, but go on speaking and don't be silent. For I am with you, and no man will attack you in order to harm you, for I have many people in this city. There's three things that Paul hears from this message from Jesus. Number one, stop being scared. I think we can safely propose tonight that what Paul might have been afraid of, afraid of his message being rejected, probably afraid of more physical harm, 
Lord, I've been beat already. I don't, I don't want to be beat again. I don't want to spend another night in jail. He writes about this time of fear later on. He writes in 2 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 8, he says, For we would not, brethren, have you ignorant of our trouble which came to us in Asia, that we were pressed out of measure above strength in so much that we despaired even of life. There's a whole lot of us that have become experts at borrowing trouble. In our minds, we go through a thousand problems that we think might possibly happen, but probably never will. If Miss Tammy was in the room tonight, I'd say it with her sitting right back there looking at me as I talk about it. She is the queen of what if. She's what if situations, everything, every decision we've ever, what if, what if, what if, what if, what if. We, we live in America with, with, with very little fear of ever actually being beaten by proclaiming our faith. The most that we'll face is social shunning, someone looking at us and calling us a lunatic or a fanatic, but yet that keeps us, that, that fear keeps us from boldly defending our faith. God tells Paul, don't you stop. You keep on preaching. Don't be scared. Don't allow fear to keep you silent, is what he's saying. Number two, Jesus himself reminds Paul, he says, you're not alone. I got you, man. I am with you. Be strong and have good courage, God tells Joshua in Deuteronomy chapter 31, verse 6. Be strong and of good courage. Don't fear nor be afraid of them. For the Lord your God, he's the one who goes with you. He'll not leave you nor forsake you. The Heavenly Father knew exactly what Paul needed to hear. And he comes to him and says, man, I got you. You're not, you're not by yourself. We all need to be reminded from time to time to keep our eyes riveted on the Lord and not on the perplexities of this life. We, there's no way. We, we cannot accurately analyze our problems without a sense of his presence. Because if you start trying to do that, it'll drive you stark raving mad. Every situation that you find yourself having to, to maneuver through, we need to analyze that problem with the idea that he's going to be in the midst of that problem. And it'll do wonders. <laughs> it'll help you. And the last thing Jesus tells him in verse number 10, the last part of verse number 10, he says, you're not going to do this in vain. He said, I've got many people in this city. Don't you give up. There's a whole lot of folks that ain't heard yet. I think those words were directly spoken to Paul, but they have a clear application to us today. We can't quit, y'all. There's too much at stake. There are too many that have not heard. God's word apparently got through to Paul because of the encouragement that God gave Paul. He remained in Corinth. We'll find later on as we, as we work way through this more. He stays there for a year and a half. A, for a year and a half, teaching the word of God, discipling those new converts, leading him to later write to this same group of people, 1 Corinthians 15, 58. Therefore, my beloved brethren, you be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. Does that not sound familiar? Does that not sound exactly like what Jesus just told him? Be steadfast, immovable, Always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your labor is not in vain. God's promise to Paul was, no one's going to attack you to hurt you. And that's going to be proven to be true in the next little portion of this chapter. We'll pick up right there. We'll pick up at verse number 12 next time with the, with the, with the brief encounter with a, with, a, in, with, a, with a guy by the name of Galileo. We'll pause right there, though, just for the sake of time. We've got kiddos waiting on us, and i got some kiddos I need to talk to tonight about maybe salvation. There'll be a bunch of prayer. i got a couple of girls that are want to talk to me about being saved and maybe baptized. So we pray that God will give us words and help these two young ladies out tonight. Thank you all so much for being here. Hope this study has been a blessing to you watching from home. And uh, we'll, we'll pick up right there in verse number 12 of Acts chapter 18, uh, the Lord willing, next time we get together. Amen. Let's pray together. Thank you, Father, again for the, for the challenge, the, the encouragement that this passage is to me. Lord, there's so many times you know the, 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 the times you've come to me, Lord, with that same message that you had to give to Paul. Don't be scared. Keep doing what you're doing. And you keep, keep a, the very idea that you've got my back is the word you keep promising to me. And it's been an encouragement to my heart. 
I pray God has fallen on receptive hearts here tonight that someone here tonight could be encouraged by this great teaching. Go home with us, God, I pray. Protect us through the rest of this week. Leave here with us on Sunday morning in great anticipation of a time in your house and your word declared through song and testimony as we gather to listen to Phillips and Banks sing on Sunday morning. I love you and I praise you for this privilege again. Protect us, guide us, use us for your glory. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. I love you, church. God bless y'all. Have a great night. God bless you. Drive safe. Right